Hey guys, what's going on? Steve DeCasa here and welcome to another DeCasa Film tutorial. This one's gonna be a basic photography 101 lesson, filmmaking 101, videography 101. You've never touched a camera before, this is the tutorial for you. Many times I've been on shoots, especially around fashion week or especially around just a time where there's lots of videographers and photographers at the same place and people have looked over my shoulder and said, wow, that looks great, what are your settings? And my settings, according to my own mind, are just, just proper what they should be, just to get a good exposure. And it occurred to me that people might be looking at the back of their screen and fiddling with dials and they just see numbers on the screen. They don't really know what those numbers represent. So this tutorial is gonna be about what those numbers are, what they do, and how to get a great shot. Somebody who grabs a camera for the first time and just fiddling with the knobs just does their best or puts it on auto. And they can run into a lot of problems on auto mode, especially if like something's really bright and the iris it down, you can't see someone's face. A lot of crazy things can happen and it behooves you to learn the settings of the camera. Right now I'm using a DSLR. This is a 5D Mark II that I'm gonna be demonstrating with. I'm shooting it right now on a 5D Mark III and I got the 60D way up there in the back. But these tips and techniques go for any camera, 35 millimeter film camera. Basically, you're just gonna be learning the parts of the camera and how to get a good exposure. It's gonna work for any camera you have. This tutorial is gonna be in a lecture kind of style. I have a whiteboard behind me. I feel like I'm in a classroom. So, but I'm gonna try to keep it interesting, keep it entertaining. So grab a cup of coffee, grab a notepad, take some notes and let's have some fun and let's learn how to take some photos. So let's get started. So to start off, the thing that you should know is that the goal of every photographer is to get a proper exposure. That is what we're looking to do, a proper exposure. What you're looking at right now is properly exposed. What's a bad exposure? Well, this exposure is a little too dark. It needs to be brighter. Alternately, this exposure is a little too bright. It needs to come down a little. There we go. So you see what I'm saying? Obviously, it's important. Without a proper exposure, you don't have usable footage or you don't have a usable photograph. So with any photographer, with any videographer, you need to have something that's usable. And for the most part, if you get a proper exposure, in post, you can tweak things. You know, you have something to work with. Basically, the light that's coming in and hitting the sensor is proper. You can work with it later. There's data there. Like, you could have noticed that when I went to a very bright exposure, you could see a lot of details in the camera and stuff. Um, that's pretty cool. In other words, this part of the frame right here is a little dark, but in terms of what we're going for, in post, we can always bring that data that's there in the blacks. We can always bring that up if we wanted to. But when you're exposed too dark, none of that was recorded. You can't bring any of that back. And if you're exposed too bright, all of the image that you saw on my face was too bright. There's, there's no way to bring that back. So that's one really important thing you gotta know about photography. If you're too bright, it's, the information is not there. You can't bring it back in post. If you're too dark, same thing. The information is just not there in the sensor. And going back to film, the in, if you overexpose the film, it's just little bits of you know, grain in the film. You, you couldn't do anything to bring that back. No matter what you did to the film, you couldn't bring it back. A photographer or a videographer is usually working with their stuff in post and usually trying to make it look even better later on. So you don't have to worry about that when you're shooting. You just have to worry about getting a proper exposure. So how do you get a proper exposure? There are three things that you can change in the camera that affect your exposure, how bright or how dark the shot is. Those three things are called the f-stop. f-stop is also known as your aperture. The second thing is called the shutter speed. And the final thing is called the ISO. It's also called the ASA, depending on how far back you go. If lots of film cameras were ASA. But what these are referring to really is the light sensitivity. It's referring to the light sensitivity of the sensor. And we'll get to that later. It's kind of confusing to just hear it out of the blue like this. So before we move on, let's just turn on our camera right here and show you where those numbers are. So I have the 5D hooked up to a monitor. What you're seeing on the monitor is just what would be on the back of the LCD screen. This number right here refers to the shutter speed. This number right here refers to the f-stop. And this number over here the one next to the word ISO, refers to the ISO. So that's where they are. And on any camera, they should be somewhere on the screen when you're shooting or right before you're shooting. Before I break down these things, let's go through the anatomy of the camera. So here's my crudely drawn picture of the camera. This is the camera body, and this is the lens. Now these cameras are called DSLR. What that stands for is digital, Single lens reflex. 
So it's your digital single lens reflex. Now, what does that mean, single lens reflex? Well, some cameras, there are many different kinds of cameras, DSLRs are the most popular, but some cameras had multiple lenses. You might have remembered the disposable cameras. They had a little viewfinder right here that you look through, and then this was the lens. Sometimes when you're up close on something with one of these disposable cameras, you take a picture, and the picture turns out to be, like if you take a picture of a flower, it turns out that you only got part of the flower. It, the picture didn't turn out the way you wanted. You wanted the picture to be this beautiful flower like this, uh, that's not that beautiful, but you wanted the picture to be centered like this, but you ended up getting the shitty like side of it. That's because the viewfinder that you were looking through and the lens were parallax. They weren't focusing on the same thing. If you look through here and frame through this window, the lens is not seeing what you're seeing through the window. In other words, the light that was coming into the lens was going straight to the film or straight to the sensor. The light that comes into this little window was going to your eye. So what you saw here was not what the lens saw, is basically what I'm saying. What you saw in the w viewfinder window of those old cameras was not what the lens was seeing. That's called parallax. These type of cameras are called range finders. They still exist, they're still around, but they're old school. Obviously, you want an accurate picture. You want to see what's gonna strike the lens. You wanna know exactly the framing you're getting. And that's what you get with a DSLR. How, how does this work? Well, light comes in the lens, right? It goes, and it goes through the lens and it gets focused and then it gets projected out the back. Now, right now in the DSLR camera, there's a mirror. This mirror is sitting kind of like this. It's at a 45 degree angle. Behind the mirror are two things. There is a shutter. This guy is the shutter. And then there's the sensor. This guy is the sensor. We'll talk about that in a minute. So the light comes in the lens and it hits this mirror. So this is a mirror. Let's use a different color to demonstrate this. Light comes in, goes into the lens, gets focused, and then it comes out the other side and it hits this mirror. The mirror bounces, the mirror bounces the light up to another mirror that's here. The light then bounces off this mirror and goes to your eye. So that's the reflex that it's talking about. It's reflecting the light from the, from the lens to a mirror, up to another mirror, and then right into your eye. So when you look through the viewfinder of the camera, the light that's hitting your eye is the light that's going to hit the sensor. That's the light that's going to make the image. Now what happens when you take a picture? You take a picture, you hit the shutter release button. And what happens is this mirror moves up and gets out of the way. That's the first thing that happens is the mirror moves up. The second thing that happens is the shutter opens. Now has, what does the shutter look like? Here's what the shutter looks like. Now the shutter is this weird sort of accordion door that's in the camera. If you could take this and turn it, that's sort of how we're looking at it now. What ends up happening is these little flaps move out of the way and make a line to the sensor and the sensor is sitting behind it. So the first thing that happens, the mirror moves up. Second thing that happens is the shutter opens. When the shutter opens, the light is exposed to the sensor. Now the sensor is what makes the image. The sensor is this cool little digital thing that's inside the camera that is sensitive to light. It turns every little pixel of that sensor turns the light into a one or a zero and it makes an image. That's just how it works. It's a light sensor. So to recap, Light comes in through the lens, hits a mirror, hits the other mirror, goes to your eye. When you take a photo, the mirror moves up out of the way, the shutter opens, and the light hits the sensor for a certain amount of time. That's what makes the picture. When this is all done, the mirror moves back down, and the light is redirected to your eye. So I'm gonna demonstrate this to prove you that I'm not full of shit. So now check it out. You can see in the viewfinder here that my hand is coming through the shot. You can see. So here's my, little, here's my fingers. The light that's coming into the lens is coming out of the viewfinder. You put your eye to here and you can see what's through the lens. Now when you take a picture, you'll see it got black for a second. For that second, well not a second, but for that fraction of a second that there was black, that was the mirror moving up and the shutter inside opening. Let's do it again. <laughs> Kids, don't try this at home, but I'm gonna demonstrate to you guys. I took the lens off, you can see the mirror, See, if I put my hand here, you can see that it's reflecting. If I take a picture, you can see 
the mirror moves up out of the way. I'm getting up close now. Once again, do not try this at home. You're not supposed to really keep the lens off of the camera because dust and crap can get inside. So don't do this at home. But once again, check it out. Now for a split second, you can see the sensor. Now, if I could move the mirror up out of the way, I could show you the, the shutter. There's the shutter. Now you can see the, the, uh, the accordion doors there. That's the shutter, that's not the sensor. Now if I were to change the shutter speed to something slow, here's, we'll do it for two seconds. You're gonna see the sensor for two seconds. Here we go. That's the sensor. Crazy, huh? What happens is the mirror moves up, the shutter opens, and it closes. Do not do this at home, people. I am a professional. I know what I'm doing. So that's how the camera works. Let's move on to our three variables. We're gonna start with aperture, also called the f-stop. What is it? Well, this is the one thing that is controlled by the lens and not by the camera itself. Inside every lens is an aperture. An aperture is a hole. That's what it is. It's a hole. So basically what you're doing is you're adjusting the size of that hole. I don't know where inside the lens the aperture is. It might be here, it might be here. I've tried to do some research about this, but it's, it's hard to tell. It's probably somewhere in the back, but it doesn't really matter. But basically inside the lens, there's an aperture, there's a hole. And what's really cool is the way that they're designed is they're designed with these blades. So when you adjust the iris, these blades in a crazy cool geometric pattern close or open and what you're doing is you're controlling how much light is entering the lens. Obviously, when the aperture is fully open, like this, you're letting in more light. When it's more closed down, you're letting in less light. So, if you're shooting something that's really bright, close the iris down, it's gonna let in less light, you're gonna have a proper exposure. If you're shooting something that's really dark, open up the aperture, you're gonna get more light in. I happen to have a really cool lens that I can show you these things at work. I managed to get my hands on some Zeiss CP2 lenses, these compact prime lenses. These are amazing. This is an 85 millimeter. Now these are cinema lenses. They have a PL mount on the back. They don't go on the DSLR cameras unless you have an adapter. But I'm not shooting with it right now. I just wanna show you the aperture. So check it out. This would be an aperture wide open. Look at that. That would be an aperture that's closed down. Open, closed. Now what I'm doing is I'm turning the iris dial here. Open and close. This is a manual iris lens. Now the lenses on the DSLR cameras, you change the aperture through the camera. So it's kind of confusing. These cameras, they, they are smart. They speak to the lens. Digitally speaking, the camera speaks to the lens. If I take the lens off one more time, you can see right here, there are little metal pins and there are little metal pins on the uh, lens itself. So that sends data from the camera body to the camera. So when you change the aperture, that's what's going on. When you change the aperture using DSLRs, this is what's happening inside the camera. What's unfortunate is that you don't really see it happening. So check it out, I'm changing the aperture. You can see it's getting darker. But you don't see what's going on inside the lens. Inside the lens, that aperture is getting closed or it's opening. So when you're flipping around on the back of this camera here and you're changing the dial and, you, and your, your, your image is changing, you wouldn't know what's happening. You don't know what's going on. You just know that it's getting darker, it's getting brighter. Well, what's happening with the f-stop is that the aperture is getting more open or more closed. It's kind of confusing because you're changing it on the camera itself. You're not changing it on the lens. So a beginner like yourself might think that you're changing something inside the camera body when in fact the camera is just sending the, some information to the lens and the lens is changing the aperture by changing it here. If you were to use a manual type iris, then you have to change it on the lens itself. The digital signal doesn't do it for you. I thought I'd get up close and personal for you guys. So check it out. You can see I'm reflecting the, uh, 
LED light that I have on the, uh, the camera there. So there's the blades, there they are. Now I'm gonna open up the aperture. See those cool blades in wor at work? It's really cool. So that's closed down. And that's open. That's what's happening inside the lens. Now to the numbers. You saw what happens inside the lens. The aperture gets bigger and smaller. But how does that equate to numbers? What are those settings, right? When the aperture is large, it has a lower number. I don't know why they do that. You would think with largeness comes bigger numbers, but that's not how it works. The larger the opening, the smaller the number. Think of it this way. You may have some crazy friends out there who have gauges in their ears. I know I do. I mean, I live in a city. I have lots of different kinds of friends. I have friends who have gauges in their ears. They stretch their ears and they put these uh, earrings that stretch them out. The smaller those gauges are, the bigger the number. So if someone has a 22, it's pretty small. If someone has a four, it's pretty big. So think of it that way. That's my mnemonic for it. At least it was my mnemonic before I just remembered it. So when you're at like a 2.8, you're pretty large. And when you're at a 22, you're pretty small. So once again, right here is the 22.8. Could scroll up to four, 5.6, uh, eight, 11, 16, and so forth and so on. So the amount that the aperture is open or closed, they're referred to as f-stops. Someone might say, what f-stop are you at? That's the number that the, corresponds to the opening of the lens. DSLR cameras, usually by default, they increase or decrease the f-stop by one-third of a stop. So a full stop, let's say 2.8, uh, the full stop to the next f stop would be f4. One, two, three, four. So f4. So that's one stop. 2.8, 4. If you want to do two stops from 2.8, 2.8, f4, 5.6. That's two stops. 2.8, 4, 5.6. That's two stops. Now, but the camera gives you the increments of one thirds of a stop. So we're at 2.8, 2.8 and one third. 2.8 and two thirds, full stop. Now we're at F4, F4 plus one third, F4 plus two thirds, and F5.6. So that's how these cameras usually are. Lots of things in the camera are done by third stops. It's confusing, but that's just the way it is. This is the language that we speak. So to keep going, F5.6, 5.6 and one third, which is 6.3, 5.6 and two thirds, which is 7.1, and now 5.6 and 3 thirds, which is one stop, which is F8. F8 plus a third, F9, F9 plus a third, F10. Now we're at a full stop, F11. We'll keep going, F11, third is 13, another third is 14, 16 is the full stop. Then we'll continue, F18, F20, F22. That's the full stop. So to show you on the Zeiss lens, the manual lens, you can see the F stop here is 2.1. When we change the aperture, we go to 2.8. Next full stop is uh, f4, f5.6, f8, f11, f16, f22. Now you see on this lens, there's no third stops. If you wanted to do somewhere in the middle, you would just place the iris somewhere in the middle. So this would be, some filmmakers call this a 2.8 f4 split or you could do 2.8 and one third, 2.8 and two thirds, or you know, 2.8 and a half, whatever you wanna call it. You know, people have different words for it. But if you were exactly at 2.8, you'd be here. If you were exactly at, two, at F4, you'd be here. Or you can put it somewhere in the middle. That's the great thing about these lenses is that you can put it anywhere you want, really dial in your F-stop. So right about here, let's see where that is. That is, ooh, exactly 5.6. So we can open it up a little. And that's like, you know, four and a half. So you can have fun. These are really smooth and beautiful. And I hope that demonstrates exactly what f-stop is. And I think we're gonna move on to the next thing. But before we move on, I just wanna sort of give you a warning that when you change your f-stop, regardless of getting a proper exposure, something else can happen to your shot. Something that's artistic or something that you can choose to do. We'll get to what that is later. But just as a note, when you change the f-stop, something happens, but something can also happen when you change the shutter speed, and something also happens when you change the ISO. So, hopefully I'm getting you interested to keep watching. Yeah.
Next thing is shutter speed. What is shutter speed? Now you know what the shutter is because I showed you before what the shutter is. So what shutter speed is basically is how long the shutter is open. So basically what shutter speed is, how long the shutter speed is open. Literally the time that that accordion door swings open. Or actually, as we saw before, I was wrong. The shutter, the, the accordion isn't sideways, it's vertical. So basically it's how long that shutter opens up to expose the light to the sensor. So what do the numbers mean on the camera? You can see right here, at least for a Canon, that's the shutter speed, but it says 50. What does that mean? 50 what? That doesn't make any sense. It's because you have to know that it's not 50, it's one over the number. It's one over 50. So what it is, it's one fiftieth of a second. That's what your shutter speed is. That number, just imagine there being a one over and then that number. So to demonstrate this, you can see one fiftieth of a second is pretty quick. It's pretty quick. But let's turn, let's turn, just to demonstrate, let's turn the shutter down a bit. For right now, we're gonna go down to a second. Take the picture, one second time. Literally, Shutter speed is time. Now at this point in the tutorial, this is where I kind of have to split the information up into two sections. You have your video guys or film guys, and then you have your photographers watching this tutorial. Let's go to my photographer friends right off the bat. Now for photos, your shutter speed matters obviously, but you have a lot more play with shutter speed. As a filmmaker, we're sort of stuck to a certain shutter speed. We can't really mess with it too much unless we're really going for a stylistic look. But just for the tutorial, just for photo, the faster your shutter speed, the faster you take your photo, the faster your shutter speed is, obviously the shutter is only open for a less and less amount of time. So if you're taking a photo of somebody moving really quickly, you might, if your intention is to stop that person and to get a nice clear image of that person, running or let's say it's a race car or a horse going by really fast. If your intention is to stop that person and to get a really crystal clear image of that person as they're running, no blur in other words, then you want a really fast shutter speed. I mean, you can go up to, you know, one thousandth of a second. What does this even go up to? If I go the, the fastest, one four thousandth of a second. That's how fast that the Mark, the Mark II can shoot. So, I mean, that's really quick. If you're shooting at one four thousandth of a second, a race car, a horse, it's gonna, it's gonna stop pretty, pretty dead on. You're gonna have a nice clear image. Now, as you, as you will know, you saw when I did it, the more times we increase the shutter, the darker the image is gonna get. So if you're taking a photo and you're outside and it's really bright, maybe adjust the shutter. Now shutter speeds don't really equate to a certain kind of stop, like f-stop, like f2.8, f4, and those numbers in the middle are not really stops. Shutter speed's sort of different, but on DSLR cameras, they do increase in thirds of a stop. So if you go one click down, it, the math, you know, the math is a little bit weird. So it's 1 80th over a second, you know, 1 over 80, you know, 1 80th of a second. We click up, now it's 100th of a second, 125th of a second. The, the camera has you know, different shutter speeds built in. But just so you know, every click is a third of a stop. So if we click more, it's a third of a stop, click, click. Let's have a little experiment here. Let's say we're at f-stop 5.6 and we're still a little too bright. We change our f-stop and we see, oh, you know what? f8 looks good, that's a whole stop. But we like f5.6 for a certain reason. We don't wanna change f5.6, we can change your shutter speed, one, two, three. And it should be the exact same exposure. So this, shutter speed 60, f5.6, should be the exact same as f4 at 125, or it should be the exact same at f8 and shutter speed 30. Two completely different settings, but the same exposure. Now, this might sound confusing, but basically it's just messing with numbers. If we go you know, dark on the f-stop, one, two, three, then we can go lighter on the shutter, shutter speed and vice versa. If we go one, two, three brighter, we can go one, two, three darker on the shutter. So you basically have a lot of play between the f-stop and the shutter speed. So 
to continue with the photographers, if you're looking to stop something, you wanna do a fast shutter. If you're looking to purposely blur something, like let's say you put the camera on a tripod and someone's running by, right? The camera's on a tripod and someone runs by and you take a slow shutter, the shot will look great and that person that's moving will be blurred because the light that's coming in and hitting the lens, the shutter's open for that full amount of time. So let's do an experiment. I'm gonna use this camera right here. I'm on a tripod. So what I did was I shut the camera off, I changed the shutter speed to one second, and I changed the aperture all the way down to f22. Because since we're open for a second, there's gonna be a lot of light coming in, and we need to close the aperture down. Now I want to blur myself, so I have to put it at a second exposure. One second that that shutter is open, a lot of light's gonna come rushing in. So in order to combat that, we turn the aperture down. I also put the ISO down, but we haven't gotten to that yet. So here's the picture. I'm gonna set it to the self timer, 10 seconds. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk when the shutter goes off. Here we go. Let's take a look at the picture. Now you can see that's me that weird blurry thing. Now I'm gonna take another one. I'm gonna take another one with a self timer and this time I'm just gonna wave my hands. So I'm gonna stand still. When the shutter goes off, I'm gonna wave my hands. I feel like an idiot. <laughs> so let's take a look at that picture. So I look at that. I, my face, I'm, and my shirt, and my pants, and the camera, and everything else, because I'm on a tripod, that's clear, but look at my hands. I'm moving them so fast that you can't even see them because I'm blurred. Now let's do one more and I'm not gonna move so fast. This time I'm gonna move my hands slowly. I'm just gonna go like this. Let's take a look at that one. So check that out. You can see that when the shutter is open, if something is moving with a low shutter speed, with a slow shutter speed, whatever happens while that shutter is open, that's gonna be on the camera and you're gonna see that blur. Now if I take a photo where I'm not on the tripod at a second exposure, watch this. Look at that shot, it's a weird picture. You can see where the, my lights are, you can see that streaked across the sensor and everything else just looks kinda weird and dreamy. So as you can see, you can have a lot of fun with shutter speed. You can do really cool things, do weird ghosting effects and you can draw with light if you have a shutter speed that's really slow. I don't know why I'm still looking at that camera. <laughs> Should be looking at you. So that's for photos. But for our cinematographer friends out there watching, our filmmaker friends, moving on to you now, what do we do for video? Can't really do the same thing, can't really go by the same rules. We don't have a lot of play with shutter speed because weird stuff can happen. Now at a high shutter speed, what ends up happening is this weird staccato effect. How the f do you spell staccato? When your shutter speed is high, you have this weird staccato effect. What ends up happening is there's this weird, like, thing. So let me show it to you. So now I have this camera set to a 400 shutter speed. I'm gonna go crazy. You see what it looks like? I can't explain it. It's like a weird, like, even though there should be some kind of a blur, but there isn't. There's no blur. Nothing, so everything looks kind of crazy. And I look crazy too. Now you can go for this kind of look. You're, like if you watch the beginning of Saving Private Ryan and they're on the battlefield and the dirt's exploding, you can see every bit of crap in the dirt from the explosions going off because they shot that at a fast shutter. It's a look, it's a style. Now at a slow shutter speed, obviously it's blurry for video. For video, we're trying to avoid blur. Now you can see, now I'm at a slower shutter speed. Now look at the blur. I'm moving really fast. You can see there's crazy blur. See that? Now in a photo, it looks cool, but in video, it's a little too blurry. And what ends up happening is, it tends to be look, like it looks like a little soft, because if I'm walking, and I'm doing a little bit of a movement, and there's a little bit of a blur, things don't look sharp, things don't look clear. So what do we do? What's that? There's gotta be some magic spot that's not too blurry and not too staccato. 
And there is. That magic spot is called 180 degrees. What the hell does that mean? It's basically just trying to emulate what the eye sees. You're walking around in real life looking at things and when a car drives past, it's kind of blurry may not perceive it to be that way. We might just think that we can see it clearly, but if you really analyze things and look at the cars and planes going by and somebody running, it does have a little bit of a blur to it. And 180 degree shutter speed, or shutter angle, is the closest approximation to what our eyes see in real life. It's that magic spot. How do you get the 180 degree shutter on these cameras? These cameras have these numbers here. Well. I'm going to teach you. That's what this tutorial is about. To get the 180 degree, it's pretty much a formula and you have to memorize this formula. So it depends on your frame rate. Now, we're not going to really get into this, but you will notice that when you shoot video on these cameras, there's different frame rates. How many frames per second? Standard films, most films are shot on 24 frames per second. Um, most TV shows, reality shows are shot at 30 frames per second. And a lot of video games and things like that are shown in 60 frames per second. So, and also if you're shooting slow-mo, you might want to shoot 60 frames per second. Kind of not, I'm kind of getting away from the basics now and getting into sort of more advanced. But let's just know, there's 24 frames per second, 30 frames per second, 60 frames per second. And then if you're in England, the standard over in England and Europe is 25 frames per second. Right now, I'm shooting this in 24 frames per second. So how do we get our 180 degree shutter? It's very simple. Take your frames per second, times it by two. Take the number, times it by two. You get 48. And then, that's your shutter speed. Now these cameras don't achieve precisely 48, 1 48th of a second. The closest you can get is 50, 1 50th of a second. So, at that fraction of a second, there's really no difference. So 180 degree shutter on a DSLR at 24 frames per second is 50 shutter. That's why I shoot on 50. Now, if you were doing something more for TV, not for a film, you're doing a TV like a reality show and you're shooting your camera at 30 frames per second, same thing, take it times it by two, which is 60. Your shutter speed should be 60 shutter for 180 degrees. And we can keep going. 60 frames per second, if you're shooting that, if you're shooting some slow-mo stuff, times by two, 120, 120th of a second. Now, these cameras do achieve 60, shutter speed of 1 60th, but they don't do 120. The closest is 125. So if you are shooting 60 frames a second for some reason and you wanna do 180 degree shutter, um, you wanna do 125. And then if you're in jolly old England, and you're shooting at 25 frames per second, obviously that times two is 50, your shutter speed is 50. So in a nutshell, that's what you're looking for video guys. You're looking for a 180 degree shutter. Unless you're going for something more stylized. If you're shooting an action scene or something where you want that crazy staccato effect, shoot the shutter speed up. Or if you're looking to blur it for some reason, I'm sure people can come up with an aesthetic reason to blur, you might wanna bring it down. But the DSLRs only go down to 1 30th of a second. So it's not gonna give you too much blur. So I'd say it's your best bet to either be at 180 degrees or faster for some kind of style. Okay, let's move on. So we're on to our last variable, ISO. What does ISO stand for? I think it stands for the International Standardization Organization or something like that. Basically, it's the company who invented the standards. Does that matter? No, it doesn't matter at all. They're just numbers that refer to light sensitivity. What is ISO exactly? What, what does that mean to be sensitive, more sensitive to light? Basically, it's brightness. The higher your ISO number, the brighter your image will get, your exposure will get brighter. But there's a cost for that brightness, and that's grain, or what they call noise, digital noise. The more ISO you're doing, the more digital enhancing you're doing to the image, the more graininess, the more noise that you're putting into the image. Here's an example. I'm shooting this at 12,800 ISO right now. Now it's hard to tell because there's white behind me, so maybe I can grab something dark. Here's a tote bag I found. You can actually, where you can see it is in my, in my shadows. Check out the shadows right here. Let's zoom in. So check out the shadows. At 12,000 ISO, 
it's really trying to enhance the image and it's making the image a lot more greeny. Let's move into. See the green? It's digital noise. Now, you know what though? Green isn't too much of a problem. It can add a style. If you're looking to do some sort of like crazy stylistic, very grainy, like artsy thing, then noise is cool. And you can, you can do a lot of cool stuff with this. But for the most part, noise is bad because you'd rather add that noise in post. You'd rather control the noise and the effects in post rather than bake it into your shot. So now I'm shooting at ISO 640. So what else about ISOs? ISOs can save you, especially in low light situations. If you're in a really dark area, you're gonna need to bump up your ISO. So let's say I open up my iris to the brightest it, has, it can be. This lens goes to 2.8. The shutter speed, I wanna keep it at my 180 degrees, so I keep it at shutter speed uh, 50. But the ISO at 100 is a little dark. So in order to maintain that proper exposure, you don't wanna to be too dark, bump up the ISO and you can bump it up until you're happy with your shot. So ISO becomes really important in low light situations. And especially with these cameras, they're always saying like, oh, this sensor is really good with high ISOs. You can barely see the grain. Every new generation of cameras that come out have better low light capabilities. And what that means is it's less grainy at the higher ISOs. Like the 5D Mark III is really good actually. You saw it, 12,000 ISO, which is very high. You're gonna have the same kind of grain as the 5D Mark II has at 5,000 ISO. So it's pretty crazy. Now it's the same exposure level. You're still going in one third stops. With every ISO you jump up, it's still one third of a stop, one third of a stop, one third of a stop. But from camera to camera, from 5D Mark II to 5D Mark III, the graininess gets less and less. It's the technology as it gets better over time. So for instance, on the 5D Mark III, at shutter speed 50, 2.8, and ISO 640, it's gonna be, or let's say at ISO 5000, it's gonna be, you know, if you're in a really low light situation at ISO 5000, it's gonna be pretty grainy. Now, if you're on the 5D Mark III at the same exact settings, it's gonna have the same exposure. It's not gonna be any brighter. If the settings are identical, it's gonna be the same exposure, but the graininess will be less grainy on the Mark III because it's a better sensor, it's a better camera. I prefer the 5D Mark II more because it's sharper, but we can get into that in another video. So once again, to recap, with a higher ISO, you're gonna get more grain or noise. But the grain is decreasing as technology improves with different sensors. And the ISO can save you in low light situations when your aperture is wide open. To get a little bit more advanced when it comes to ISOs, there's something you should know about native ISOs. What's a native ISO? When you get up to cinema type cameras, you're gonna find that they have a native ISO. And what does that mean? Well, for instance, the RED camera has a native ISO of 800. And what that means is that the sensor is designed for 800. Pretty much it's locked at 800. In other words, if you expose for things while the camera's at 800, if something is blown out, the sensor is blown out. There's no data recovery there. Whereas if you bring the ISO down to like 320 on the red and you're looking at areas that are blown out, that's really blown out because you, the camera is set for 800. So at 320 ISO, when things look darker, if something's blown out, then that's really blown out. But if it's at 800 and you're looking at something and it's pretty bright, might be blown out. You might be able to recover some of that. It's not completely gone. When it comes to DSLRs, the 5Ds and, and the 7Ds, they have native ISOs as well. Um, it's a little bit different. They have, their native ISOs are on the 100, the 200, 400, 800, uh, 1600, 3200, those are their native ISOs. That's where the sensor is set and where it's um, designed. But it turns out that the ISOs, one third of a stop below those native ones are the cleanest, believe it or not. What's happening is that at the native ISO of 200, when you go a stop lower, there's like a digital pull, they call it. They, the sensor is pulling away some of that grain. So it turns out that the native ISOs, the 100, the 200, 400, if you go one third of a stop before them, those native ones, they end up being the cleanest and clearest, the less noisiest. So when you shoot on the 5D and the 7D and the uh, 5D Mark III, you wanna try and aim for the ISOs that are 160, 320, 640, 1250, uh, 2500, and 5000. 
They're the one third stop below the natives. Once again, the natives are 100, 200, 400, 800, 1600, 3200, and 6400. So once again, really quick, when you're shooting on the Canon DSLRs, you wanna try and keep your ISOs at these, what they call magic numbers. They happen to be the cleanest ISOs on the camera. Okay, we're wrapping it up now. So there are the three things. You have your shutter speed, which equals how long the light is hitting the sensor. You have your ISO, which is how sensitive your sensor is or how grainy and noisy it is. And you have your aperture, which equals how much light is coming in, the amount of light that's hitting the sensor. Now, when you change each one of these settings, like I said, there's byproducts, which can be stylistic choices. With the shutter speed, the byproduct is blur. You can make something blurry or you can make something staccato, not so blurry, clear. With ISO, it's simple, it's how grainy it is. Now, from my experience, you wanna try and keep the grain to a minimum. It's always better to have less grain baked into your footage and add some later if you want, rather than putting it into the recording and never being able to remove it later. But what's our byproduct for aperture? I didn't talk about this. I didn't talk about it because it opens up a huge area and that's called depth of field. Depth of field is how much from the camera to infinity is in focus. So here's the camera sitting on a tripod and over here's infinity. It's so far away it's past the camera. That's the horizon. Your depth of field is where something starts to be in focus and then when something stops to be in focus. So in between these distances, your subject or whatever it is that's there that lands within that physical distance away from the camera is in focus. So if you have a deep depth of field, you have deep focus, something let's say five feet from the lens all the way to infinity will be in focus. So if something is standing, if, a, if a, a, your subject, a, anything, a car, a person, anything, is in between the five foot and the infinity range, it will be in focus. And if anything is, you know, standing behind each other, some, you know, Bob's standing here, Bill is standing here, Jane is standing here, and Douglas is standing here, everyone will be in focus. That's called deep focus. Now what's the opposite of deep? Shallow focus. Shallow focus would be something that let's say is five feet away from the lens to, I don't know, seven feet away. If your subject is standing in that magic spot there, they're in focus. If they're here, they're out. If they're there and out, you know, anywhere from here to infinity, they're out. So something like this would be shallow focus. And shallow focus can get really shallow. You can have shallow focus that's so shallow that the tip of someone's nose could be in focus and their ear could be out of focus. And that's shallow. So in a situation like this, you don't want to have that shallow focus. You at least want to have the tip of their nose and their ear that all to be in focus. You don't want it to be that shallow, or as I like to call, that critical. So how do you control your depth of field? So like I was saying before, depth of field is a byproduct of your aperture. So here's how it goes. So here's a wide open aperture. I'm gonna say it's F2. And here's a closed down aperture. Let's say it's F11. When you're open, when your aperture is open, you have a shallow depth of field. When your aperture is closed, you have a deep depth of field. Now what's a good way to memorize this? I like to think of it as a telescope, or I like to show people this cool little trick. If you take your hand and you close it down, so that there's just a little bit of, just a little bit of a hole, just so you can see through a little bit. You're just making a tiny opening. If you put this up to your eye so that there's just a little bitty tiny hole at the end and you look at something very far in the distance, that thing that you look at will be easier to see. It'll be more in focus. What's happening is literally the light has to come into this little tiny area and then shoot out the back of the lens. So once again, here's the lens. Here's the aperture, and here's the hole in the aperture. When the light has to come in and squeeze into a tiny little hole and then get projected back out the lens to fill the sensor, the, the light is being squished down into a tiny little area, which means that it's compressing all the photons 
into that one little spot. So everything from here to infinity, all of that light has to squish into one little tiny area, literally getting focused into a single point. And that achieves your deep focus. When you have something like this, the light doesn't have to squish through that small of a hole. So what's ending up happening is that shallower depth of field. When you focus on something and you're trying to get a crystal clear shot, it's not gonna be able to do it because the aperture is wide open. Let's show you an example. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set the aperture to be deep focus and I'm gonna take the picture with the camera there and me here and then I'm gonna take another picture for shallow focus. You can see the difference. I'm gonna to talk to this guy up here. So, I'm gonna do deep focus. We're at F22, 30 shutter. We're gonna go way high on the ISO. Let's do 5,000. So that's one picture at F22, small aperture. And that's the second picture at F4. So let's look at the difference. Here's F22. You can see that the camera is in focus and I'm in focus. And here's F4. Look at the difference. The camera is in focus and I'm way out of focus. Look at that. Now that's the shallow depth of field. And then back to the F22 shot, that's the deep depth of field. So you can see when I had it on F22, small hole, <laughs> uh, deep focus. When I had it on F4, large hole, <laughs> Uh, shallow depth of field. You can see the stylistic choices you can take. And that's what this is all about. Let's move on to the next thing. Now you know what all these different settings do, and now you can concentrate on your own style. So you saw the difference between F22 and F4. Hugely different style, hugely different emotion you get out of that. One of them is deep focus, you can see everything. The other one looked almost cinematic. The, the foreground was in focus and I was out of focus. It looked very cool, it looked very cinematic. It's that beautiful, what they call bokeh or bokeh. It's when the out of focus areas of the frame look really beautiful. It's called bokeh, B-O-K-E-H. A lot of cinematographers love bokeh. Photographers love bokeh. It's those out of focus areas. It's weird because with our human eye, we can't look at something that's out of focus. Whenever we look at something, it's usually in focus. We can try and put it out of focus, but that just kind of hurts our heads. So when we look at a photograph, it's very surreal because we can look at things that are out of focus and really pay attention to the different ways that it, it blurs into the background. It's really interesting, really beautiful. It's one of the things I love about cinematography and, and, cinematography and photography. But to go back to style, shutter speed equals blur. So what's a style you can accomplish? You can say, okay, I want to blur this person. I wanna make sure he looks like a blur when he runs by, slower shutter speed. Or I wanna stop this person, I wanna do a jump and I wanna stop him in midair. Well then I know, okay, fast shutter speed. So you can start to make your style out of this. With ISO, for the most part you wanna keep the ISO down and you keep it less grainy, but you might say, hey, let's make it really dirty, really grainy, let's up the ISO. Or you might be in a low light situation where you wanna go, shit, I really need to get more light, I need to get a better exposure. You bump up the ISO. You can still use some stylistic choices with it too. But one of my favorites is the f-stops, or the aperture. And as a byproduct, depth of field. Here's where you can get really fun. Here's where you can get really interesting with your depth of field choices and doing lots of cool stylistic things. I know I wanna have this person in focus, I want that person out of focus, and especially with filmmaking, if I wanna do a focus pull from one to the other, and I want a really nice pull, I'll keep my aperture wide open, focus it on this one person, and then at a certain line, to the other person, and boom, you've got a really great style. You can choose to do things with focus that are only really in your head, and these settings are how you do it. And a perfect example of using these settings in the right way is to just show you what I already did. In order to get that comparison between the depth of field, the shallow and the deep depth of field, I had to move some settings around. I knew, okay, I wanna make sure that it's a deep focus. So I know I gotta put it on F22. And that's a huge thing about cinematography and photography is trying to come up with the different style you want and locking off one of those three variables. So I know I wanted deep focus. So I know I needed to have my shutter speed at F22. I, I had to lock that off. So that's locked off. Now what do I do? Okay, well, at F22, the hole is so small that there's very little light. So I needed to decrease my shutter speed. So I was down 
to probably one fifteenth of a second, maybe even less, maybe like one eighth of a second. It depends, this is what you can mess with. I also knew that I had to up my ISO, I had to get more sensitivity. So I was up to like 5,000 ISO. I think I was even higher than, I might have been at 6,400 ISO because I was locked off here. And then the opposite, on the shallow depth of field picture, I knew I had to go to the maxima aperture and that lens goes to f4. So now I know, okay, to get the shallowest depth of field I can out of that lens, I'm locked off at f4. I can't touch f4, but I'm gonna get that great, I'm gonna get that great depth of field. So how do I get a proper exposure? Proper exposure is now that I'm letting in so much light, it's really bright. So now I gotta decrease my shutter speed. So I was at like one over 125. I was at maybe one over, I don't remember, 250. So I knew how to increase my shutter speed. And with the ISO, because there was so much light coming in, I had to bring down my ISO. I was at 160 or even 100 ISO, which is great. It's a great product because this is also less grainy. So I locked off the F4. I achieved great depth of field, but I had to change this and I had to change this. And that is how you get your proper exposure. You, you say to yourself, what do I wanna do? I wanna blur this guy. I wanna make sure it's blurry and deep focus. You gotta ask yourself, what kind of shot am I looking to get? And then, once you know what you want, you lock off one of your variables. And, then, and once you lock that off and achieve your style, then you decrease or increase the other ones as you see fit to get a proper exposure. And that, my friends, is Filmmaking and Photography 101. Please let me know if there's anything I missed in this tutorial, anything you want me to go over, and I will gladly go over it. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments below, and I will get back to them. This tutorial has been a long time coming, and I put a lot of work into it, and I hope you guys like it. Please check out my other tutorials, and as always, happy filmmaking. Peace.